In this review, we're going to talk about kinetics. So, the previous lecture was about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics are about energetics. They tell us what should exist in the world if the world were in equilibrium. Now, an equilibrium world is kind of a boring world, right? If everything was in equilibrium. What makes it possible to engineer materials and to make useful materials is the fact that we're able to trap and use uh, non-equilibrium processes and what controls the rate of those non-equilibrium processes are kinetics. Now, at the simplest level, we're talking about Arrhenius. type problems. So in Arrhenius type problems, we're talking about a system where we've got, say, a free energy G and some, well, let's call this whatever, X, some reaction coordinate. And you know, X is going to be something complex. It's not just a, a single direction. But you have some set of coordinates. You're going to start in one of these coordinates, call this state x1, and it's going to transition to state x2. And the way that it does that is it goes over this energy barrier and into it. Now, this distance, red, that is the delta G of the transition. So this is the energetics that we were talking about in the previous uh, discussions. Because it's the difference between state 1 and state 2. The kinetics, what controls that, is this distance. The distance that has to be overcome in the process of transition. And you can have two systems which you know, very clearly has a large delta G for the transition, but if the kinetic barrier is sufficiently high, uh, they won't react. Now, the uh, Arrhenius type approach is to say that the probability of the transition is equal to exponential of minus delta G star over KT. So that is going to be the energy per event. And if you have an energy per mole, then you replace the Boltzmann constant with the gas constant in order to have a molar expression of the energy. And this is the probability of the event occurring, and it's proportional to the energy barrier. Now, it's worth pointing out to those of you that are working in this area that the Arrhenius method, while not wrong, has really been replaced by what's called transition state theory, or TST, in which instead of just talking about it as a simple uh, you know, barrier to overcoming, people are actually looking at uh, the shape of the energy well at the saddle point. So that's a saddle point. Uh, if you think about this, it's not really a, a, a single uh, hill, but it's a point in a multi-dimensional landscape. And transition state theory focuses on that. But the Arrhenius theory it is certainly how most of us think and how most of us operate. And from the probability, we can get the rate of the transition. And the rate of the transition, R will go as nu x minus delta g star over kt nu x. Here 
So writing out G is equal to H minus Ts. So here these Ts are going to cancel. That's going to be some coefficient out front. This is going to depend on the enthalpy. And remember in the case of solids, the enthalpy and internal energy are very close. And this new, that's the frequency of attempts. And again, talking about transition state theory, this is where transition state theory has a, uh, an advantage because transition state theory uh, handles that uh, frequency for you. The natural progression for this and in your textbook too, which I'm, I'm hoping you've read, is to talk about diffusion because diffusion can be thought of as a Arrhenius process and for the macroscopic behavior that we're interested in, this is uh, an essential an essential mechanism. So again, this is just going to be a review, so I'm not going to go through the derivations. But diffusion at a macroscopic phenomenological perspective, we treat this using fixed laws. And the first fixed law is that the flux is equal to negative d dc dx. So this is the, the flux. So let's say we have some uh, membrane that has some finite thickness and atoms that are passing through that membrane the molecules are passing through that membrane they're occurring at a rate of number per meter squared second so you've got some area and you're looking at crossing per area per second. That concentration, that's going to be a density, so it's going to be number per meter cubed. That's the concentration per meter, so it's going to be number per meter to the fourth, which means this diffusion coefficient is necessarily meter squared per second in order to get in order to get the units correct for, for flux. And this concentration is going to be the concentration on uh, concentration on the right side minus concentration on the left side is delta C and then this thickness of the membrane is your delta x going into your differential. So fixed first law is used in the case of having a, uh, a steady state uh, flux. So you can imagine this having some thickness delta x at your concentration. So C left C right, and then you have your delta C over delta X at the slope. Delta X as a as a width. This diffusion coefficient, this uh, sorry diffusivity coefficient. That diffusivity coefficient is going to depend on the rate of atoms hopping from one site to the next, and there's different mechanisms for that. Uh, but because it depends on the rate, and we imagine ourselves having you know, some situation where, say, you've got uh, some atomic lattice, and in order for this atom to hop from one site to the next, it has to overcome some energy barrier where these atoms push apart 
and it transitions. So you've got some delta G star. So that tells you it's got to be some Arrhenius relation. So D is equal to D0 x of minus delta H D over RT. So that's the enthalpy and whatever, R or K, depending on, on how, you, uh, how you like your uh, uh, units. Studying diffusion, there are many pathways we can talk about. Uh, solute atoms on site in metal is going to be vacancy assisted. Uh, but if we go over, say, to semiconductors, then semiconductors are largely vacant. You know, if you look at a, at a semiconductor lattice, it's something like 75% empty. So that's going to be interstitially driven. Uh, and depending on what the pathways are, you get a, a different set of reactions and a different, different set of different set of expressions. These complexes, they, they don't have to be simple, just an atom hopping, but you can actually wind up with multiple species that, that, are, that are working together to cause diffusion. You can wind up with cases where atoms get paired together, and you'll have like sets of atoms that diffuse together through a lattice, and their mutual strain will assist the diffusion process. You can get uh, vacancies that assist the diffusion process. You can get uh, charge transfer that, that assists the process. Uh, and you can have long range uh, kick out mechanisms in, in, in which an atom will hop out into an interstitial spot, zip through a, a long uh, procession, and then hop back onto the lattice uh, when it becomes available. Uh, a good example of that is, say, gold and silicon. Gold and silicon, if you put gold on a surface, you can wind up with gold on one surface and then gold on the opposite surface because you have a long range transport where gold will zip, zip through the lattice. So measuring this or computing it uh, becomes a field in and of itself. Uh, so this is Fick's first law. Let's talk about Fick's second law, which is for non-steady state diffusion. with respect to time is equal to the diffusion coefficient, the second derivative of concentration with respect to position. And that's the fixed second law, which gives us the transient uh, problem. Uh, in order to solve this, you've got two derivatives with respect to position and uh, one with respect to time. So you need two boundary conditions and one initial condition. Uh, this has been solved many times. Your textbook gives one simple example, and that simple example is a material with an infinite source. So we say this is a constant of value uh, C1. It starts out with concentration C0, and then over time, you have diffusion in to the sample. And if we plot this, you have a constant, and let's call this uh, C, so this C1, this is C2, T equals zero, and then over time, it gets this type of this type of shape, 
And, and this shape is described by this side. Concentration is a function of position and time, defining, of course, this position here as x, starting at x equals 0, minus c0, the initial concentration inside, concentration on the exterior, c0 is equal to 1 minus the error function, earth, x over 2 square root of d t. So the square root of d times, uh, sorry, the square root of d times t. So the d and the t are both are both inside that radical. And and from this you can you can ask several questions about you know, given a time and a, and a temperature and a temperature by the way remember the temperature comes in through that diffusion coefficient because it's an Arrhenius expression. So given a time and a temperature, you know, at what distance can you find a certain concentration or, or what have you? There's, there's always ways that you can take this type of solution and, and manipulate it. Uh, it's worth pointing out that this is only the solution if you're holding the, the surface at, at a constant concentration. The reason that we're interested in this is because many of the kinetics that we're interested in are controlled by diffusion. So, for example, imagine, uh, well, imagine solidification, right? Last, last uh, chapter, we had uh, phase diagrams that looked like this temperature. Okay, many phase diagrams, but this is a simple one. We have liquid, I'm solid, so alpha plus liquid. And if, say, we have a, a composition, so this is A rich, that's B rich, and say we pick some composition or up here, and say we're cooling down, and we form some alpha in that liquid, and let's say, you know, we just keep cooling it down, so we keep forming, we keep forming that solid, well, that means that we have some system in which we have alpha and it's surrounded by liquid. We know that we can get the fraction of alpha and liquid by taking the inverse Lever law, right? And we know we can get the composition from dropping those verticals. But what that means is it means that the composition of the alpha has much more B in it than the composition of the liquid. So if you can imagine, you know, zooming in to alpha and liquid, as that solid is forming, it's absorbing B atoms It's also absorbing some A atoms. But it's absorbing B atoms much more rapidly because it needs it needs those in order to get this B rich phase. The rate that it does that necessarily depletes the concentration of B atoms in the liquid. So if you look at this interface, I say concentration of B 
at that interface. And that's going to be x, b, alpha. And out here is going to be x, b, liquid. And here we have this depletion because B atoms are being absorbed preferentially, which means you get a delta C over delta X, and you necessarily have diffusion of B atoms toward the interface. So the rate of growth of this type of uh, well, solidification is necessarily diffusion controlled. Another example where diffusion is important is in oxidation. Right? We know that metals form oxides, but we know that it takes a long time, and that's because once you get a layer of oxide on a metal, that acts as a diffusion barrier. Side. And here's your environment. So this oxygen has to diffuse through in order to react and create more metal oxide and to grow a scale. So if you think about that, that means that the rate. Call this, uh, call this x. The rate that that oxide can grow is going to be proportional to the flux of oxygen. And because it's such a slow process, we can treat it as steady state. It's not really steady state, but we can approximate it as such, right? So that means that. Uh, say it's equal to some uh, coefficient J oxidation. And then over here we had our uh, negative D, D, C, D, X, our fixed first law. Well, in this case, we know that DX, that's just the, the, the thickness of our oxide. And we have delta C, that's going to be uh, the gradient from well, huh, this way, the gradient, we'll say it's constant in the environment and it's constant at zero at the metal surface. So that means that this is equal to uh, some minus alpha d O2 delta C over x dx by And we can take move the x over here, move the t over here, and integrate to get x squared is equal to minus alpha d t delta c. So that means that the thickness is going to be proportional to the square root of d t. So if we know the rate of diff uh, the diffusivity, O2, and we know the time, then we know approximately how much oxide is grown. And this D2, remember, DO2 proportional to DO2. It's going to have a temperature dependence. So we know that the temperature, we know the time, and we know the diffusion then we can approximate the thickness as a function of time. So this is an example of, of where diffusion comes into play with respect to uh, kinetics.